It's my privilege to bring you the Bible reading tonight. It's from Matthew chapter 24, verses 30 to 35. If you want to follow along, it'll be on the screen. Or if you want to go the old-fashioned way, it's on page 993 in the Pew Bibles. So Matthew 24, verse 30. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near, right at the door. Truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. John's going to come and speak to us now, and as he comes, I'll just pray for him. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is alive. It's a living thing and it can speak to us. Lord, we just pray that you will speak through John tonight. May, may your Holy Spirit anoint him. May he know your presence and may the words that come from his mouth be from you to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, David. Welcome all of you res guys who are here and those who are visiting from other places. You are welcome in this house. Everybody is welcome. I have a story to tell to start off with. When I learned that I was going to go over to England to study theology, uh, I realised that the year started in October, so I had to finish my teaching career in time to go, and I thought my wife and I have got plenty of time to prepare so that we were ready to go to the UK and start a course in October. About January of the year before, I got a letter from the Dean of the college who taught New Testament Greek, and it was a lovely letter. Welcome to college. We're glad you're here. And by the way, this is the text we use for New Testament Greek, and it would be helpful if you're up to chapter 19 by the time you get here. And I thought to myself, where in the world do you learn? How do you teach yourself New Testament Greek? There was a deadline. There was the date of the first class at the end of his letter. So he said, I want you to be ready for this date. Well, all the opportunities that I thought I had to do all sorts of things flew out the door and I wound up having to spend time with somebody I knew who knew about Greek where he tried to teach me and I got up to chapter 18, would you believe? When I got there, I said to the dean, look, I'm sorry, I didn't get quite there. He said, that's okay, so long as you're close. Anyway, that was, uh, that, that was part of the deal for me. I had, to, I had to be at a certain place before I could start. I want to talk tonight about something uh, that we, I think, have never talked about before. Certainly when I talked about it this morning to the, uh, to the folk in the church, they'd not discussed this, they'd not really thought very much about it. What happens in the end times and at the last moment, what does God expect of us? Now, I have no idea why I'm preaching about this, except that when I planned the preaching, the Lord said to me over and over again, you will preach on this one on your last day. So here we go. What do you have to be prepared for by the day? You ever thought about it before? Immediately after the stress of those days, now I'm not going to be dealing with the first part of chapter 24. The first part of chapter 24 identifies the characteristics that are going to be hanging on around the world. Rough stuff, deeply rough stuff. And then he goes on with this. The sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky 
and all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. What happens if the Dean of Heaven wrote us a letter and said, I want you to be ready. What does he want of you? What does he want of me? Do we know when this is going to happen? I mean, at least in, in, in Oxford, I had a, a date that I was going to be starting the, the Greek course. We have no idea. And I will guarantee that you've rarely, if ever, thought about the last moment. Am I right? Am I right? Rarely, if ever, thought about the last moment. Thanks for all the hands up. I, I see your hands. Ever thought of preparing for this time? Or can we? Can we even prepare for this time when it comes? Don't know. What would God expect of us? How do you know what God would expect of us? Matthew's attempt to prepare us in that stuff that we've had the readings from tonight does this. There's the intro of 21, uh, tw sorry, 24 and the verses 1 to 31, which spell out the nature of the happenings on the face of the earth in the time just prior to Jesus' coming. And then there's a barrage of parables. Now, what's interesting here is that this passage, 24, is available in Matthew, Mark, Luke. Now, that's not unusual. Most of the Gospel writers stole stuff from all over the place. That's well known. But neither of Mark or Luke go on to say in a barrage of parables what God expects. They say, this is what will happen, but they never say, and when you get to that time, this is what needs to be in place. Now, this is not something you and I can leave to the last moment, because the truth is we will never know when he's coming. But we've got to read the signs. Let me talk about the signs. There will be earthquakes. 50,000 people dead just a little while ago in earthquakes. There will be wars and rumours of wars. Ukraine's going well. Syria's growing well. Other places you can, you can talk about. Uh, there will be a whole range of things beginning to happen. Now, I know the geographers amongst us say, okay. oh, well, I understand the earthquakes because the tectonic plates crush up against one another and the earth is just getting a little bit old. And... No, 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 no. That might be the reason for it, but it's happening. And it was predicted. And when it's predicted, the predictor said to us, look to the evidence and you'll see that I'm about to arrive. There are two he issues held in tension in the stuff that we've been reading so far. And they are these. First of all, there's suddenness, verses 32 to 41. Uh, it might be helpful if you've got the Bibles open in front of you to actually look at this. Uh, if you've got Bibles there, you might find that useful. Follow through with me. In verses 30 to, uh, 32 to 41, we get this picture of it will happen and you won't even know. You will see the evidence around you, but when the Lord comes, when you hear that trumpet sound in the sky, you will not be able to predict it. It could happen now! Not happening now, but it could come. <laughs> there wasn't even a trumpet call. And then there's the issue of preparedness. The issue of saying in the, in the parables, and the parables are not direct stories, they are, they are to lead us to understand what's going to happen. Verse 24 following, and chapter five, 25, and if you've got the scriptures, Matthew chapter 24, 25 is where I'm working from tonight. First of all, in relation to suddenness, uh, the parable of the fig tree. When you see a fig tree beginning to loosen up a little bit, the figs begin to appear on the, uh, on the vine, and you know that that is the time for summer to start. I've got, around my garden, I've got red lilies beginning to appear. Do you know what they are? They're Easter lilies. They appear just every time Easter is about to happen. It happens every time. They say to me, get ready, Easter's around the place. So the lesson of the fig tree here is look at the fig tree, see what's going on, and then be prepared to say, well, we can get a bit of an idea of things are coming. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son. Even the Father is the only one who knows when Jesus is coming again. Jesus himself does not know. So we must read the signs. Verses 24, sorry, chapter 24, 1 to 24. There are the signs and the stuff that I talked about. Earthquakes, rain, 
flood wars. Then there's the notion right the way through the rest of chapter 25 with a series of parables where Jesus identifies, and it is Jesus who's been quoted. Matthew has deliberately lined up these parables after chapter 24 in a line to say these are the things, it's his advice to us, using Jesus' words about what we need to do to be prepared for that last moment. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. And the parable is the parable of the house owner and the thief in the night. Now if you've got that in front of you, it's verses 43 to 44. And the basic gist of it is if the, if the house owner knew when the thief was going to break into his house, surely he would have locked it up so he couldn't get in. It makes good sense. He didn't know when he was coming. And so what Jesus is trying to say to us is that you need to be prepared without even knowing what's going to happen. You've got to step into the preparation zone years out from when it might happen so you are prepared. I had about nine months to get up to chapter 19 in the Greek and by the time I got there in, in, uh, in that October, I had to be ready. Are you ready now? Do you know what's going to happen to you? If he fronted up now, would you be able to say to him, I'm ready? I'm ready for you to come. The lesson, be ready. Don't get caught out. Oh, I'll put it off a day. I'll, I'll, I'll do it in a minute. No, it's all right. I'll... This is character formation, see? Character formation doesn't happen over a period of time. It doesn't happen instantly like that. So that just before he comes, as I see the trumpet of stone, I prepare. It doesn't work like that. The next one. The parable of servant behaviour. Where who then is the faithful and wise servant? You've got the text in front of you. But suppose that servant is wicked. A bloke goes off and says to his chief servant, would you look after the place, please? Don't know how long I'm going to be gone, but uh, what I need you to do is to be prepared to look after the place, keep the servants in order, make sure the work gets done, make sure the vineyards are uh, uh, taking the grapes, everything's in, and I'll come back and one day I'll find you uh, and, be, and be grateful to you. So he goes off and comes back. And what happens if the servant said, I'm gone, I can do what I like, we'll have parties in the house and we won't worry about the money, we'll spend it all. Servant behaviour is that behaviour which sees the master's goods, the master's character, the master's behaviour reflecting itself in the servant. When the master comes back, finds that his servant has been doing the wrong thing, this text, if you're reading it at the moment, will find him chopping his servant to pieces. A lesson? Be responsible. Be responsible, people of God. Don't think about taking shortcuts. Don't think about taking, doing different things that might serve you in other different ways. Be responsible. Listen to the voice of the living master. Listen, listen to what he says to you and don't stray from the straight path. There will be all sorts of tugs along the way to do this or to do that or to do something else. This parable says to us, keep yourself online. Then there's the wise and foolish virgin. Most of you will know this story. And the issue is that uh, there's a bridegroom coming for the wedding. Now, in those days, they, they didn't do weddings like we do weddings now. What happened in those days is that would the, 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 the groom would rip around the whole town, hoop lying around the place and saying, I'm getting married, I'm getting married. And the whole of the city, the whole of the town would know that this bloke. So you never knew when he was going to arrive. It might be midnight before he got there. So these, these wise virgins and unwise virgins said to themselves, we need to prepare for this bloke coming. We don't know when he's coming. See, five of them said, oh, look, you know, we, we better go and get some oil and make sure we've got enough oil to keep the lamps burning so that when he gets here, there's lamps and there's light for the reception. The other five said, oh, I don't need to do that yet, do we? 
We can, we can wait a little bit. No, when he comes, we, 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 we'll go and get it then. So five go and five stay away. And then all of a sudden, the groom is here. And the, 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 the wise virgins trim their lamps and go and light the place. And the young wise virgins say, we haven't got the oil left. Let's have some of yours. And the wise virgins say, not on your life, Nellie. If we gave you oil, then we would both run out. Don't rely on other people. Take the responsibility seriously. At that time, the king of heaven will, will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Verses 1 to 13. The lesson, be prepared. you feel prepared, ready to meet the king at the moment? Did you think at the beginning of my time here I would start to talk to you about the depth of spiritual relationships and about the nature of this, that and the other? Did you not realise that these are the things that God is telling us? Be prepared. What does it be prepared mean? Be prepared means be who you're supposed to be under the authority of Jesus. Be who you're supposed to be in terms of your character. Be who you're supposed to be in terms of your behaviour. Be who you're supposed to be in terms of your whole life Keep on this relationship with Jesus and out of this will come the whole notion of when the trumpet sounds, I'm here. I'm ready, Lord, take me home. Then there's the parable of the talents. Again, it would be like a man going on a journey. He called his servants and entrusted his property to them. All right, so there are three servants who are supposed to look after the property of the king. You know the story. The first one gets 10 talents and the, the boss says, now go, and go away and work with that and return it to me when I get home. The, guess, the second guy gets five talents and the boss says, here you go, five talents for you, do what you can do please for me. The, the last guy gets two talents. Well, the guy with, with 10 ripped out and when the boss came back he had another 10 as well, that was 20. Very good, well done my man, you will be ranked at the top. I with five talents came in. He said, oh, I've done very well. I've got five talents more. The boss said, well done, young fellow. You have been very, very trustworthy. And the guy with two came in and he said, oh, I knew that you are a hard guy to work with. I knew that you rep where you didn't sow. I knew that you were a hard task. My, who knew that you were bad? So I went and buried your lot out in the back garden and so I wouldn't lose anything. So here is the two, dollars, two, two talents you gave me. And the boss said... You must be joking. Are you serious about the responsibility of a servant? Are you serious about... Have, well, have you not used the things that I gave you? John says to us in his Gospel, I am the vine, you are the branches. Remain in me and you will produce much fruit. It is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. God looks for his students, for his, for his people's students to prepare and to produce fruit. He expects us to produce fruit. He doesn't say to us, you will never be a millionaire if you're a follower of Jesus. He also says that fruit is spiritual fruit. That has to do with the character of a relationship with me. The whole purpose of this is understanding you have been entrusted with the things of the master, your money is actually his. Your ability in your DNA and in the gifts that you've been given by the spirit, they are actually his, that he has put into your life. Now the question is what are you going to do with it? Some people say, oh, that'll be great. I'll buy a new house and I'll get a boat and I'll get, uh, and I'll get a, a, a ski boat and I'll get a... Uh, and I'll get a Be productive. Don't go into this world believing that you're going to make a million dollars for you, but be well aware if the master gives you that particular task to build for him, then that's what he means. It is for him. Be productive. All right. Then, of course, there's the sheep and the goats. And here we face an extreme difficulty because it's not something that we can do anything about. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another. As a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, he will put the, the sheep on his right 
the goats on his left. You know what this is saying, don't you? God takes this as being super, super important for us to stand, understand. Be accountable. One day I will come, I will name you by name, I will look you in the eye, and if you are mine, I will say you are dressed in my son, go to the left or the right, whichever he chooses is the best way. Now, let's not make too heavy weather of this, but let's understand it. So far as God is concerned, when he comes, all bets are off. And the time to decide whether we follow him, the time to decide whether we love him or don't love him, is over. He will say to us, you go to the left or you go to the right. Not on the basis of my judgment of you, but on the basis of the decision making you put in place before this moment arrived. And then, of course, and this is the difficult bit, he will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they'll go away to eternal punishment. And the, the reading that we have there has this to say. If you did not feed the poor when they were hungry, you did not feed me. If you did not look after those who are sick, then you did not look after me. If you did not house those who had nowhere to live, church, if you did not do these things, did not do it to me and you'll go away to eternal punishment. The lesson? For God this stuff is life and death for us. It really means it. It's really significant. The fact that we don't ever think about it even before that day arises amazes me because I've not thought about it before either. But what I want to say to you is this. Jesus' advice for the last moment is be responsible. Allow your character and your behaviour to reflect who he is. Be prepared. When he comes, say to him, Lord, I am, I am ready. I have done everything you asked me to do. I have built up in my life a, a, a location where you are welcome and you, you can come. Lord, I have been productive for you. Protective sometimes in a way that the world doesn't understand. Taking off time to do this and to do that in ways that serve you but not the world and not even my own wealth. Not When I take time off to go up Central Australia and figure out what's going on. I've been productive for you, Lord. Be accountable. Yes, Lord. I have been under your authority from the moment I learned that you were my Lord and my Saviour. I've been accountable to you for every step, every breath, every behaviour. I've made myself and deliberately chosen to be able to say to myself, this is not what I believe. This is not what I do. This is who I am. You get that? This is not what I believe. This is not what I just do. It is who I am. That's me. People ask me, who are you? And I say, well, I've got two definitions of me. First of all, I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. And second, I'm a servant of the living God. You want to know who I am? That's it. My well, life is sold out to him. And he says to us in this, I want you to sell out to me so that we can do things in this world together that were meant to be done in the first place. And he says at the end times, I'm going to be asking you about that. This really is life and death for us. Let's pray. Father God, every one of us will understand this in a different way. People are going to be hearing what I've just said in totally different ways because they bring to it the hearing aid of the past. They bring their character, they bring their personality. So it's going to be interpreted in ways that I haven't got anything to do with. But I want to pray that that interpretation 
would very, very clearly show the power of your spirit in their lives to demonstrate your greatness, your majesty, your authority, your power and the truth of who you are as the Lord of the universe. Would you do those things in these lives? And would you allow them to be the people of the future who serve you with all of the power of the Master? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much, John.